All right, this is not my, really my usual kind of talk. And it's the kind of talk that I find a little bit difficult to give. I think it's a, a lot better read than listened to, so please go read the paper, but I'm going to do my best. Um, in artificial general intelligence, the general part to me, among other things, says we need robustness. We need to be able to react and adapt to whatever. And there are a lot of approaches to doing that. People have talked about them all day today and will continue to, but the approach that I want to talk about to that is that of creativity, in particular computational creativity. And what I mean by computational creativity is uh, building computational systems that do things or produce results that an unbiased observer would deem to be creative. So that's a nice dodgy uh, definition, but that's what we're going to stay with. There's a lot of work people do in this area and in a lot of different domains and some work in generalization and abstraction of those domains. I'm not going to talk about any of that today, but I am going to try to step back from that a little bit and philosophize about what might be involved with, with a computational creative system and what that might mean about um, uh, artificial general intelligence. One way to do this, of course, is to look at humans and try to compare with how humans do it or take that as a, as a inspiration. There's some difficulties with this, but I'm going to try it anyways. So I'm going to use this algorithm as a surrogate for the algorithm for creativity. This is taken from Chitza Mihai's book on creativity, and it is very similar to what a lot of people would suggest at some level is what people do when they are being creative. Um, uh, the, they're sort of shown there in a linear order, and there is some linearity in those things that happen when people be creative, but nobody would suggest that the linearity is strict or that this is a one-pass sort of algorithm. There's obviously going to be a lot of iter iteration, likely some recursion, but we're, we're going to just treat each of these five things separately and, talk, and just mostly ask questions about them. The goal, of course, is to return something awesome, having done these steps. And this is a general algorithm, so it works for everything. Here is our surrogate, or our archetypical computational agent that runs this algorithm. I'm not going to claim this is a definitive architecture, or it's not even an architecture. All the interaction stuff in the middle is purposely not shown, because I don't know how it works, and nobody does, really. The point is there's a bunch of internal mechanisms in the agent, and a lot of those up there, I think everybody would agree, are necessary, if not sufficient, for creativity. And there are um, external interactions with the environment as well. And I would like to discuss how the five steps of that algorithm I put up a minute ago um, might employ these different mechanisms or relate to them in some way. And the goal, of course, is for the agent to produce an artifact, I've called it here, something that is useful and novel as, and may have other attributes as well that people consider are creative. And that artifact could be anything. It could be art, it could be a mathematical theorem, it could be a strategy, a design, uh, a joke, whatever. So there's step number one, preparation. Preparation is the act of learning or acquiring knowledge, background information from the environment. This is non-trivial for computers to do, but there's enough resource material out there now that's been developed by people over a lot of years that I would like to suggest this is more of a difficult engineering challenge than it is a really a philosophical challenge at this point. It's certainly not a done deal, but I think this one is not so hard for computers in a lot of ways. Um, one other point I'd like to make about this is, besides acquiring background information about whatever domain you're working in, or, or want to be creative in, you also need some aesthetic major. When I say aesthetic here, I mean some way to measure when you've done something great, when you've done something creative, when you've done something nice something that others will value and find novel and maybe surprising. And you can't just acquire that aesthetic from the environment. That's not very creative. It's not very intelligent. You might start there, but a really creative agent will 
and generate their own aesthetic at some point, which brings up an interesting question of how, where does that come from? Is it a meta-level creative act? And we're going to have a lot of these meta-level questions showing up as we keep talking. Um, the second step, incubation, is usually described by people taking all that preparation and background knowledge and stuff they've acquired and just kind of sticking it on the back burner and letting it simmer. And in fact, a lot of people will say they get their good ideas or they, something finally clicks or they make progress when they're not actively thinking about what they're supposed to be thinking about. They're still thinking about it at some level, but they're not doing it consciously. Maybe they're asleep, maybe they're in the bath, maybe they're taking a walk or whatever. Um, there's the question of whether this unconscious processing or this conscious decision to not process is necessary or um, for all kinds of create, creative agents or maybe only for humans because we're so lousy at doing this sort of drawing connections and letting things bubble around in a conscious way. And I would also like to say that I suspect this is another of the five steps that I think might not be so bad for computers. In fact, we might argue computers have an inherent advantage here over humans in the sense that they don't get bored, they don't get tired, um, they don't get distracted when they're working on something, they can just bubble on it. They don't need to put it in the background so that they're, because they're sick of it or whatever. They don't get um, misled by bias. Um, Although that bias thing is a bit of a sticky wicket because good biases are useful and we would like to um, have the agent incorporate good biases without being misled by poor ones. And that's another meta level question. Where do those good biases come from? How does an agent come up with good biases to use during this incubation step? Uh, this is the fifth step in my algorithm, but I've put it third because it's the third out of the five that I think are maybe not so bad for computers. Not to say all of these are easy, but they're the easier of the five. Um, this is the step at the end where we have the 99% sweat equity after we have the 1% of inspiration. Uh, people often give the example of Thomas Edison with the light bulb and how he went through thousands of different filament materials before he came up with carbon as a good one. And that is a good example, but Edison is a good example not only for the sweat equity of going through all these different materials, but also for the fact that after he did that, he did a lot of marketing and a lot of infrastructure development and education that got his electric light bulb out and usable to everybody. He didn't actually invent the light bulb. There's a lot of other people that had that idea before him. He just really went for it. He made it happen. And that's the elaboration step. That's what he was really good at. In a way, this is the reverse of the preparation stage. Instead of acquiring knowledge from the environment, we're now dispersing knowledge to the environment, convincing people that we have a great idea, teaching them about it. And I think um, software can do this to some extent. It shouldn't be too bad either. Although there is one other sticky point, framing the information, marketing it, selling it to people, getting them to pay attention, is often a creative act itself. And so once again, the metal level raises its head a bit. Okay, here's step number three of the original algorithm, and this one, I suggest, could be very tricky. The problem with this one is, when you talk to people about insight, they almost always suggest that it's something external to themselves, they have no control over it, it happens when it happens, and um, people call it things like revelation, inspiration, luck, um, serendipity, magic, whatever. And that's where the quixotic title from this talk came from. The title of this talk came from luck. Right? How do computers get this external to themselves lucky aha moment that everybody says is necessary when they're being creative or most people say it is? Um, there's at least four ways to think about this. One of them is, in fact, that people don't actually have these aha moments. They just um, tell themselves that they do because they don't understand what's happening at their, in their co cognitive level or at the subcognitive level. Another possibility is that, uh, in fact, that insight is necessary, but it doesn't actually originate, originate outside the agent, even though the agent perceives that it does. 
The third one is it may be necessary for human creativity, but not machine creativity, just like flapping wings are necessary for birds, but not for airplanes, in the, in the, in the case of flying. And then the fourth, the fourth point is that maybe in fact something extraneous, completely extraneous to the agent is in fact necessary and beyond the agent's control. And computational systems might be in trouble here. There is some subset of humanity that would be very tickled to find this out because they somehow feel like this makes them better than computers or they avoid the being taken over by computers that we just heard about in the last talk because they're creative and computers are not. Um, but another way to look at this is humans have the same limitation in the sense that it has to come from outside of them as well. And perhaps humans can be the deus ex machina that has to touch the computer from outside in the case of, of this insight problem. Uh, the last step, evaluation, has some tricky issues in it as well. This is internal evaluation, not external. I mean, uh, what the agent itself thinks about the artifact that it created, not what the broader community thinks. That's important, but that comes later. Uh, the agent should somehow try to model what the external world thinks about them in its internal representation. And uh, we're going to start out by assuming that this external evaluation, this is another meta-level problem, where did the aesthetic come from? We mentioned this already. We're going to assume for the moment that this aesthetic evaluation is computable. Just, we're just going to make that assumption. The agent has some process that it can compute, given an artifact, it can compute whether that artifact is aesthetically pleasing, or correct, or useful, or novel, whatever our measure of creativity is. And if that's the case, we have a simple algorithm for creativity, very simple. We pick an artifact, and check if it's good enough, and if it is, we're done. If it's not, we pick another artifact, and we just go. And this is going to be computable if E is computable, obviously. Um, F here is uh, a process that evaluates whether E likes A, and I have written it this way for a reason that we'll see in a minute, but the language of F is simply the set of all artifacts that the evaluation process accepts, or rates as acceptable. And this is all there would be to creativity. Uh, all there would be in quotes, of course, we have uh, the issue of any interesting problem having uh, an infinite space to work in, and how do we choose A? Right, how do we do this in a, in a reasonable way? And that suggests yet another meta level problem. And I've just repeated the original algorithm here with M's in front of it because we're at the meta level now. And we're now trying to create a search strategy in some space that tells us how to choose the artifacts in the original space. And we have all the same kinds of questions. We don't have time to talk about any of them right now. Um, and I would also like to make the point that there's a dual, you can have a dual representation of this problem. Instead of looking for a search strategy in the search space, we can modify the space itself so that the search strategy becomes trivial, right? Try and make the space convex or re represent, re -represent the space. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more to say there, but I think I'm going to go on. Now, if, if in fact the evaluation mechanism itself isn't even computable in the sense of decidability, then there's a very simple um, reduction from the halting problem to the evaluation problem, that is deciding whether an artifact is a good artifact or not. Um, it's as bad as the halting problem, at least. And so the whole comp computational creativity problem becomes uncomputable which is, in some sense, not, not very surprising, but something that we need to think about. It tells us how we ought to, to think about this. Just to, to wrap up, let me make four points. If computational creativity is undecidable, I would suggest that artificial general intelligence is also undecidable. If computational creativity is semi-decidable, which I think it might be, although we haven't talked about that, it doesn't necessarily follow that artificial general intelligence is unless computational creativity is AGI complete or sufficient. I think it is, but we also haven't talked about that. Either one of these are, are really 
too bad because humans aren't deciders either. In other words, the, the complexity issue or the computability issue isn't, it, it's a very rigorous level and humans can't beat it either and we're still pretty good at what we do. So however we do it might be good enough for computers as well. And, and, and the last point is there is a path through the minefield of questions and issues that I just touched on today that allows for computational creativity to be computable in the strict, strong decision sense. And if that was the case, we could just brute, brute force our aha moments in the computer, and that would be lucky for computers indeed. Thank you.